Good evening, everyone. Welcome, uh, welcome to uh, the 2020 Coles Colloquium. Uh, it's obviously different to usual. We're doing this by Zoom, but as we just as I start, I might remind everybody uh, about the sort of the Zoom rules to conserve bandwidth. We'll get everybody to turn their uh, video off once we start, and also remind everybody to mute their audio so we don't. Uh, inadvertently hear something we don't want to hear. So look, just to give you a little bit of background about the Coles Colloquium, certainly this year we're really honoured to have the Australian of the Year, a colleague, Dr James Nwecki AM from Adelaide as our eighth Coles lecturer. Uh, the Coles Colloquium was started and established back in 2013 to recognise and acknowledge the contributions of the Coles family to Sydney Hospital, to the Save Side Institute, and to the University of Sydney. So Kenneth Coles, the Ken Coles that we know's father, was a member of the board of Sydney Hospital for 22 years, and he was the chairman of the board for eight years. And in the history of Sydney Hospital, Sir Kenneth was acknowledged as a real font of wisdom and knowledge and helped to steer the hospital through the challenges of post-World post War II growth in Sydney and through the 60s when there was really a lot of change going on in Sydney. His son, Ken Coles, who we all know, served on the board of uh, Saveside Institute for close to 15 years. He was the chairman of the board when I started in 2009, and Ken certainly has given me an enormous amount of wise advice and counsel, and has helped uh, to, me to guide the Institute through some very challenging times over the past 10 years. And I think it's, you know, Ken has really helped to make the Safe Side Institute what it is today, the sixth ranked eye discipline in the world. In addition to helping the hospital and uh, and uh, the institute. Ken's served many roles in the university, the, the highest of which he was a member of the Senate, voted on by his peers, and uh, he's really had a lifetime of contributions to the university, to public life in, in Sydney and New South Wales, and indeed in Australia, and served his community a great deal. I'd also, as at the beginning of the symposium tonight, acknowledge the life and contributions of a great longtime friend of uh, Ken's, Associate Professor Chris Peterson, who was also a member of uh, the, the board of the I, of, of Safeside Institute. He was a great contributor to our institute, and as I say, was a, a long-term business associate of, of Ken's. Sadly, Chris suddenly became ill earlier this year and passed away in July. But look, I think, as I said earlier, we're really honoured to have uh, James Nowicki as our Coles lecturer tonight. James did his medical and ophthalmology training in Adelaide. He then did fellowships in oculoplastics and ocular oncology in the UK and in Moorfields. He then returned uh, to the Royal Adelaide Hospital where he established uh, and headed until recently the ocular oncology service and clinic. He established a national service for genetic testing for retinoblastoma and for von Hippel-Lindau. Uh, he he uh, has really had a long-term interest in medical retina, particularly in vascular tumours and ocular masquerades of intraocular uh, cancers. He's published more than 60 peer-reviewed publications. And as I think most people are aware, one of James's enormous contributions to, to Australia and to ophthalmology and to our region is that about 15 years ago, he established Sight for All with uh, some close colleagues, particularly with Bob Casson. And they basically, Sight for All provides subspecialty education. It equips eye clinics. It's helping to close the gap in Australia. And, he, and James, through the Sight for All, has developed a really sustainable site saving uh, model that's become the basis of the, the institution. James was awarded uh, an, uh, an Order of Australia for his contributions. He's received numerous other honours and awards and given multiple named lecturers, all in recognition of his great contribution uh, to, to Australia and to ophthalmology. And of course, most importantly, he's the 2020 Australian of the Year. It's indeed a pleasure to, to welcome James 
to give the, the calls lecture. Thanks very much, James. Peter, thank you so much. It's a real honour to be giving the eighth calls colloquium and, and thank you to Sydney Eye Hospital to all my colleagues who are listening in this evening. I think there's uh, people listening in from across the country. So it's, uh, well, I can't see you. It's lovely to be here with you all. Uh, so, um, when I received the South Australian Award, it was just over a year ago now, uh, I was talking about the fact that uh, diabetes is a, a significant cause of blindness uh, in Australia. But when I was heading in towards the, uh, the Australia Day weekend, I thought I had a deeper responsibility here, really to, to talk about the underlying uh, cause, the root cause of diabetes. And so this is something I'm going to share with you all tonight. It, it's something I wasn't very aware of at all. So it's, uh, it's quite extraordinary what uh, underlies all of this. So what I'll do now is I'll just share my screen and we'll get started. Okie doke. So hopefully everyone can see that. So I started my training as an ophthalmologist back in 1990. Uh, so I've been working as an ophthalmologist now for 30 years. And, and for 30 years, I've been dealing with the consequences that diabetes inflicts on the eyes. In fact, like many of us, every year, I'm seeing more and more patients who are losing vision, even going blind due to diabetes, in particular type 2 diabetes, which uh, makes up about 90% of cases and is a largely preventable dietary disease related to the consumption of too much sugar in our modern diet. Um, can I just ask everyone to mute themselves? I, I can't actually hear myself think because there's a lot of background noise coming through, sorry. Um, so, can Daniel, you have shared your screen? Sorry? Have you shared your screen? I have, can you not see it? Um, uh, can anyone else see it? I'm, I can't at the moment. You know, I, we can see it. Good. I okay. can see it. Oh, oh good. <laughs> okay, well, hopefully everyone can see it. And, and there's about three videos in here as well. So hopefully, uh, hopefully uh, the, the video sound comes through. So can you even begin to imagine waking up one morning uh, completely blind? You know, even as an ophthalmologist, it's difficult to comprehend. But I've had a patient who's had exactly that experience. His name is Neil Hansel. He's an everyday Aussie bloke with a wife and four kids. He constructs light machinery for a living. And he also has type 2 diabetes. And a few years ago, at the age of 50, diabetes changed Neil's world forever. Unfortunately, he neglected his disease. He paid the price. He went to bed one evening with normal sight and woke up the next morning blind in both eyes. One of my retinal colleagues worked really hard to try and retrieve his sight. Unfortunately, it was too late. Neil was to spend the rest of his life in darkness. This is how Neil sees the world these days. Basically, I think I would describe it as seeing everything as a, um, as, as a motion, not as an actual vision. The images, unfortunately, aren't clear. The images are basically what you see of a day through your eyes is what you see of a night through your eyes. Um, so there's no clarity. Obviously black figures as people or animals or you know, trees, just black onto a, uh, onto a greyish background. Neil lost his driving licence, he lost his independence and he lost his ability to teach the javelin which was his hobby. In fact it was a passion that gave him incredible joy. But the thing that upsets Neil the most is that he can now no longer see the beautiful smiles on the faces of his wife and his grandkids. This is a picture of Neil's wife and two of his grandkids. This is how he should see them. And this is the reality. Neil has been irreversibly blinded by sugar. And Neil is not alone. He's just one of over 100,000 Aussies with side threatening eye disease due to diabetes. So we all know how diabetes threatens the site, but there may be some listeners out there who are not aware. So diabetes causes damage to the blood vessels throughout the body, including the retina, uh, the light sensitive layer of tissue that lines the inside of the backs of our eyes. This is a picture of the macular, or the central vision area of the retina of a patient with type two diabetes. And this is that same eye a short time later. Diabetes can cause bleeding inside the eye. It can take away the eyesight in an instant and sometimes permanently. 
The important point here is that nearly all of the loss of vision and blindness, something like 98%, is preventable or treatable. Yet to avoid the blinding consequences of this disease, patients with diabetes need to have their eyes checked on a regular basis. In Australia, of the 1.7 million with diabetes, well over half are not having these regular, all-important, sight-saving eye checks. And that's why it's now become the leading cause of blindness amongst working age adults in this country. It's also the fastest growing cause of vision loss in Aboriginal people. So for me, as an eye specialist, for us as eye specialists, it makes me upset to see patients who are going needlessly blind due to this condition. But the thing that makes me really angry is we should not be seeing this disease at all. This was a disease that was virtually non-existent in the 60s. Now we're seeing about 250 new cases of type 2 diabetes every single day. So this evening, I'm going to talk to you about type 2 diabetes, how it's arisen, why it's a growing epidemic, and also going to look at some strategies to curb this rising tide of a disease which is a serious threat to our society and to our health system. So I mentioned before that uh, type 2 diabetes is related to the consumption of excessive sugar in our modern diet. When we talk about sugar, we often think of table sugar or sucrose. But it's important to remember that there are, is another very abundant form of sugar, and this is the refined carbohydrates, products such as white flour, white rice, white potatoes, and the foods made from these. These are all virtually pure starch, and starch is simply a long chain of glucose, which is broken down into glucose when it reaches the gut. So when we ingest refined carbohydrates, we're pretty much ingesting pure sugar. And it's really important to remember that sugar and carbs are, for the most part, nutrient poor and non-essential. There's not a single biochemical process in our body that demands that we ingest sugar or carbohydrates. And our Australian Guide to Healthy Eating, which is based on Australian dietary guidelines, is packed to the brim with unhealthy products. Refined carbohydrates, white rice, a variety of white breads and pastas, white potatoes, and also a number of products which are often high in sugar, tropical fruits, low-fat dairy, baked beans, and processed foods. Let's go back to sugar. So sucrose is made 50% glucose and 50% fructose. That's its molecular composition. And the body handles these two molecules in completely different ways. So let's look at them each in turn. So glucose, firstly, when glucose is absorbed into the bloodstream, it triggers the release of the hormone insulin from the pancreas. And the insulin helps move the glucose into every cell of our body where it's either stored or used immediately as an energy source. When I talk about glucose metabolism, I like to use the analogy of subway train in Tokyo where the train car is a cell. The passengers are glucose molecules and the subway conductor is the insulin. With prolonged and excessive glucose intake, the cell becomes full. The insulin level rises to help try and push more glucose into the cell, but it gets to a stage where it can't push any more in and we become what's called insulin resistant. And then there's a overflow of glucose back into the bloodstream and it's taken up by the liver where it's initially converted to glycogen. But the glycogen stores are limited and so the liver then starts turning the glucose into fat, which is actually exported away from the liver and stored in healthy fat cells throughout the body. So it's a, a protective mechanism of sorts. When the reduction of fat by the liver outstrips its ability to be stored, sorry, to be exported, the, the liver then starts to take on the fat and we develop what's called a fatty liver. Now we all know what a fatty, what a liver looks like, right? It's a deep, dark red color. This is a picture of a fatty liver. It's yellow because it's suffused with fat. A really good example of a fatty liver comes from the French culinary delicacy foie gras, which is created by force-feeding geese refined carbohydrates in the form of high-starch cornmeal. So a fatty liver can develop in these unsuspecting creatures within 10 to 14 days. In humans, a fatty liver can develop with excessive fructose intake in two months. So let's look at fructose. So fructose is that 50% of, of table sugar that uh, gives sugary products their sweet flavor. It's not recognized as a food by the body. It doesn't trigger the release of insulin. It actually suppresses the appetite control system. And when it's taken, and when it's absorbed into the bloodstream, 100% is taken up by the liver, and about a third is converted immediately into fat. So it's actually far more toxic than glucose in giving rise to a fatty liver. So this is a cross-section through a normal healthy liver, and you can see the uh, densely packed cells. 
And here is a fatty liver, it's distended. You can see those white spaces, which are the cells, which are uh, just full of fat. Now type two diabetes takes on average 13 years to develop after we uh, develop insulin resistance in a fatty liver. Uh, it's a complex metabolic process. In children, however, it can take two months. And ultimately what happens is that the liver can take no more fat in. So the liver exports the fat away as triglyceride in the bloodstream. And of course, triglyceride is harmful uh, to our health. And it's a high triglyceride level combined with a high insulin level, which in turn leads to the many, uh, what actually causes blockage of the arteries throughout the body uh, due to the formation of fatty plaques. And those in turn lead to the uh, life-changing and life-threatening uh, complications of type 2 diabetes. Now, we talked before about bleeding inside the eye, but the other one we all know well is macular edema. And for those non-ophthalmologists in the audience, this is a, a scan through the central vision area through the macula of a patient with type 2 diabetes. The right side is the, on the top right, and that's the way it should look. Uh, just below that is the left eye, and you can see that little mound at the very center of the central vision area, the fovea. This is edema or swelling, which is uh, due to leakage of fluid uh, into the tissue of the retina uh, due to damage to the blood vessels. And such an eye often needs to be treated uh, with uh, an injection into the eye of an antibody, an anti-VEGF. And uh, here is myself with a patient giving uh, an injection into the eye of uh, an antibody to try and seal up those leaky blood vessels uh, and allow vision uh, to stabilize or at least improve, if not improve. And I actually uh, got some figures from Medicare recently, and you can see uh, this is all of the intravitreal injections given just for diabetic macular edema over the last four years since we started using it. And you can see the rise year on, year out. Uh, and that really mirrors the growth of type 2 diabetes in our society. Last year, over 93,000 injections given. And I suspect we're up around the 100,000 mark. Uh, so this is 100,000 injections, which just should not be happening at all. Now, damage to fine blood vessels throughout the body uh, can give rise to other complications, it can cause impotence, it can cause uh, numbness, tingling, pain in the extremities, and it can also cause uh, dementia. 70% of patients with type 2 diabetes will ultimately develop dementia. So this is a disease that not only impacts on the individual, it also impacts deeply on the family. And I lost a father to dementia, so I know how hard it hits the family. Damage to the fine blood vessels in the kidney can lead to kidney failure. When the kidneys fail, the blood needs to be filtered artificially through dialysis, uh, sometimes up to seven hours a day, four days a week. I've calculated that in Australia every year, patients with type 2 uh, diabetes, they spend four and a half million hours hooked up to a dialysis machine. So this is time lost to family and friends, uh, to the workplace and to the things that they love to do. The damage to the major blood vessels throughout the body can have devastating complications. Uh, gangrene of the feet is the second most feared complication of diabetes after loss of vision. And such a foot needs to be amputated. Every year in Australia, over 4,000 amputations are performed for gangrene for patients with type 2 diabetes. And here's our friend Neil Hansel from his hospital bed in March this year after his left leg was amputated for his gangrene. In fact, this was the ninth amputation over a 14-month period since he went blind in both eyes. And he has also had two heart attacks. And so this is also a deadly disease. 80% of patients with type 2 would die of a thrombotic complication, including heart attack and stroke. It's now said to be the sixth biggest killer in our society. But if we realise that it plays a major role in the top three killers in heart attack, stroke, dementia, it also plays a significant role in the formation of hypertension and it plays a role in cancer. So it may well be the biggest killer in our midst. And if we look in the first few months of the COVID pandemic, uh, there was 102 deaths. Tragic deaths, of course, but in the same time period, over 5,000 deaths due to type 2. So these are deaths that went largely unrecognised and unheralded. This is also a very expensive disease, costing our health system at least $20 billion every year uh, for treatment of diabetes and its complications and lost productivity in the workforce. But if we also factor in all of those other diseases, it's probably many fold more than that, may even be over $100 billion that we're spending every single year. 
So how did this all arise? Humans are hardwired to love and seek out sweet things. It's an ancient survival mechanism that helped our early ancestors to survive extended, period, extended periods of fast, uh, which were common in early humans. It also allowed them to avoid uh, bitter and potentially toxic foods in their environment. Prior to the 1600s, sugar was an expensive commodity. It was the domain of healers and holy men and an indulgence that could only be afforded by the wealthy and the powerful. Over the next 300 years, rising the ability and popularity of sugar due to the booming trade led to diminishing costs, turning sugar from a luxury item to an everyday necessity. Today, sugar is cheap and sugar is quite literally everywhere in our lives, isn't it? But things took a turn for the worse in 1980 when the dietary guidelines for Americans was released. It was noted in the decades after World War II that there was a rise in heart attacks and it was thought that this was due to a fatty diet causing fatty blockage of the coronary arteries. And so this was based on no strong scientific evidence whatsoever. And so the recommendation of the guidelines was to reduce the fat in our diet to 30% and to compensate, increase our carbs to 60%. Rather than see a downturn in heart disease, heart disease soared along with that type 2 diabetes. That globally, in the last 40 years, has been a fourfold increase in type 2 diabetes, and this has been even more profound in some countries and communities. In China, for example, there's been a more than a tenfold increase in type 2. And this is somewhat paradoxical because the Chinese diet is high in refined carbohydrates in the form of white rice. But what we've noticed in China in recent years is the rise in sugar consumption. In fact, there's been a 5% per year rise in sugar uh, throughout Asia. In the Aboriginal communities, there's been at least an 80-fold increase in type 2. And I have no doubt that the diet high in sugar, refined carbohydrates and highly processed foods is driving this. And type 2 is also impacting on poorer socioeconomic areas of our country. Uh, actually, this is a, um, the Guide for Healthy Eating for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. And again, it has the same uh, uh, products which are high in refined carbohydrates and sugar. So this is a fire map of uh, Sydney. You can see the red areas which are Greater Western Sydney, Sydney where the prevalence of type 2 is up to 15%. In fact, in this area, there is now 50% of adults over the age of 24 who have either type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetes for the first time in history, which I find absolutely staggering. In fact, in the United States, now 50% of the adults have type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetes. And we now have a type 2 diabetes problem in kids. This was a disease, as you know, it used to be called maturity onset diabetes. We now have over 1,100 Aussie kids and teens with this disease. And this has been a global problem. In 2001, less than 3% of all new cases of uh, diabetes type 1 and type 2 so less than 3% was type 2. But in a 10-year period, this had grown to nearly half. And then now close to 40,000 young adults with type 2 diabetes. And they have a very concerning life ahead of them. It's been modelled that it's going to be a loss of $3 billion of GDP by the year 2030 due to lost productive life years in this group of people. And disturbingly, and there's even been a case of type 2 in the UK for a child as young as three years of age who had a, a diet which was high in sugary drinks. We've even had a seven-year-old child in this country with type 2. So what are we going to do about this? Now, if we're going to call it a dietary disease, then surely there's a dietary cure. It should be as simple as reducing our intake of sugar and refined carbohydrates and highly processed foods. However, there are a number of factors that make this a difficult thing to achieve. And earlier in the year, I came up with this concept that I call the five A's of sugar toxicity. And these are addiction, alleviation, accessibility, addition, and advertising. We'll just briefly go through those each in turn. So firstly, addiction. Sugar is highly addictive. It's been shown to be as addictive as nicotine. Its consumption activates the reward center in our brains, leading to the release of the neurotransmitter dopamine. It's what makes us feel good, it's what makes us want to do it again, and it's what gives us those cravings. And like drugs, the more we ingest, the more we need to give us that feel-good hit. Second A is alleviation. Uh, we often use sugar to alleviate stress or to make us feel better when we're down. When we're stressed, the brain releases the cortisol 
uh, leads to, triggers the release of uh, the stress hormone cortisol. And so the brain needs to balance this up with the release of feel-good chemicals. And so sugar does a really good job of that. Third A is accessibility. As I said, sugar is absolutely everywhere in our lives. You can't walk into most service stations without being confronted by a wall of confectionery. And you certainly can't check out from most supermarkets and stores without being enticed by uh, soft drinks and chocolates. 90% of all food at checkouts is just junk food. And 30% is on sale in any one week in our major supermarket chains. I find that quite disgraceful. Forte is addition. Astronomical amount of sugar to add to our food and drink, something in the order of 75%. And this is particularly problematic in remote Aboriginal communities where sugary food and drinks are in abundance and cheap, fresh and healthy foods are in scarce supply and often quite expensive. And finally, advertising. Our world is flooded with ads and TV commercials for sugary products, often in the most insidious and predatory ways. And this has been going on forever, for decades at least. So how are we going to deal with this? Well, to me, it's going to take resilience. And when I talk about resilience, I like to use the analogy of Mr. Spock from Star Trek. He's a very cool-headed and resilient character, isn't he? And I know what he'd do. He'd look to the smoking epidemic to see what's causing its decline. Back when Spock's first graced our screens in the 50s, smoking was socially acceptable. In fact, in the years after World War II, something like 80% of men smoked cigarettes. Have a look at this ad for candy cigarettes from the 50s and the caption, just like dad. The realization of the health dangers of smoking in the 60s and the subsequent banning of advertising for cigarettes, uh, the um, rollout of, uh, sorry, the taxing of tobacco products and the rollout of hard hitting uh, awareness strategies such as these, which we all know, have all made smoking socially unacceptable. And as a result, Smoking and smoking related diseases and deaths are on the decline in most countries. Not so sugar consumption, type 2 diabetes, uh, and its complications, which are on the rise. So, we're going to need to engage this same resilient approach in dealing with the five A's of sugar toxicity. So, for addiction and alleviation, it's about uh, being personally aware that sugar is highly addictive. Until early this year, me as a doctor, I didn't even had no idea that sugar was addictive. And for the other three A's, uh, it's about accountability of businesses, industry, and of government to do the right thing by the people of Australia. So let's look at these each in turn. And firstly, addiction. I suspect much of the world is addicted to sugar. Uh, I certainly was, and probably still am. Uh, the thing that I love the most is ice cream. The bigger, the better. The worst punishment that I could receive as a child was to be sent to my bedroom after dinner without ice cream. And there's rarely been a day since then when I haven't enjoyed a bowl of this treat. In fact, my in-laws actually called me the ice cream kid. This is my 30th, sorry, 40th birthday uh, um, ice cream cake. Uh, this was 16 years ago. Uh, so uh, ice cream has always been an important part of my life until earlier this year when I actually found out that I had a fatty liver. And this is a picture of my fatty liver. Uh, and I'm what they call toffee. Thin on the outside, fat on the inside. And for those of you who know me, I'm thin. I had no idea that uh, I was metabolically unhealthy. In fact, in the United States, there are more thin metabolically unhealthy people than there are fat and uh, metabolically unhealthy people. And I suspect the same goes here in Australia. So I immediately went into a sugar detox. I gave up the heavily sugared products, um, the fruit juices and soft drinks, the uh, biscuits and cake, um, confectionery and chocolates, and sadly had the ice cream. And I immediately went into sugar withdrawals, which were actually quite unpleasant. They started on day one, uh, irritability, headache, uh, fatigue, clouded thoughts, uh, and the cravings were really intense. And over the next three days, the symptoms really built up. It was much tougher than a coffee withdrawal. But after day three, uh, things started to ease off. And, and these days I can walk past the fridge or the freezer after dinner and not have to reach in and grab uh, an ice cream. So I'm not wanting to be hardline about this. I don't want to be uh, preachy. I want to still be able to enjoy a dessert when I go out for dinner. I still want to be able to receive a mint chocolate frog uh, for my birthday. And I still want to be able to uh, have a bowl of ice cream, just not every single night. For me, it was about a physical dependency. However, for many people, I suspect the addiction will be much deeper. 
we may need to engage helplines and self-help groups and uh, psychological counselling as we've done for nicotine and alcohol with uh, uh, addiction. Second A is alleviation. Rather than reaching for that block of chocolate and devouring a block of chocolate, why not take the healthier option? Go for a walk out in nature somewhere beautiful or a run or a cycle. Listen to your favourite music. Reach out to someone who's having a tough time and do a good deed. These have all been shown to be as effective as sugar in balancing that cortisol reaction that's flooding our body in anxious times. Third A is accessibility, and there are a number of strategies that we can engage here. This is uh, two vending machines in the lobby of the Women's and Children's Hospital in Adelaide, full to the brim of sugary products. I've st since written uh, to the board of the Women's and Children's Hospital and, and yet to see any action. This is the two vending machines in the study area of the Adelaide Medical and Dental School, our bastion of health, um, again packed to the brim with sugary products. Once again, I've written to the dean at this stage, nothing to report back. In fact, I've written to all the universities in South Australia, and at this stage, I've only had a positive response from uh, UniSA. Another obvious thing would be to remove uh, sugary products uh, from checkout counters, where they're preying on our addiction, they're preying on the vulnerable, and they're preying on our children. Once again, I've written to multiple stores and supermarket chains around the country, including Coles and Woolworths, and to date, no action. Except for Australia Post, who have actually said they're going to remove the sugary products from checkout counters in their corporate stores. And this is a checkout counter at uh, the Foodland store in Norwood near me. And you can see that they've replaced the sugary products with packets of nuts. So this is the sort of thing that would be really good to see going forward. The fourth A is addition. I don't know about you all, but uh, I can barely read those nutritional labels on the packets of, of food, let alone understand them. And they certainly don't tell us the amount of added sugar contained within. We have a health star rating system, which is deeply flawed. It's flawed because it's voluntary. Only about 30% of products actually use it. So what manufacturer would use uh, or place an unhealthy rating on a product that they're trying to sell. It's also flawed because there are a number of essentially unhealthy products that get a healthy rating because the algorithm uh, used to uh, create this uh, rating system is, is actually flawed. And orange juice is one of these. So a glass of orange juice has almost as much sugar as a glass of cola. And we do need to see clear front of label uh, labeling, uh, telling us how much added sugar is contained within various food products. And this is where the contentious issue of a tax or a levy on sugary products comes in. But there is some good reasoning and, and solid evidence behind it. In the 10 years leading up to 2017, there was an increase in sugary drink consumption by 30% in Australia. Sugary drink consumption has been most definitely linked to type 2 diabetes in many studies. And in 17 different countries, a levy on sugary drinks has been shown to reduce purchase and consumption. So it certainly makes sense to me. And it's been modeled that 20% levy and sugary drinks uh, would lead or raise over $600 million, which can then be used to fund health initiatives and inequalities which exist in our society. And 77% of Australia is actually supportive of this. Finally, advertising. Once again, there are a number of strategies that we can use here. Um, one of the obvious things to remove ads for uh, sugary products from TV uh, during those hours when our kids are watching. Move ads for sugary products from government buildings and services such as buses and trams. And we need to see a far reaching campaign to raise awareness amongst the Australian public of the multitude of health dangers of excessive intake of sugar and refined carbohydrates, not just obesity and type 2 diabetes, but also tooth decay. Sugar is the leading cause of tooth decay. Now 40% Ten to twelve-year-old Australian kids have caries in their adult teeth, and it's now the leading cause of surgical admissions. Uh, it's also in children, and it's also um, uh, the leading cause of days off school, something in the order of fifty thousand every single year. But I think we also need positive messages that sugar, sorry, that type two diabetes is preventable, and that it's also reversible. And this is something that's not well known, uh, certainly amongst ophthalmologists, but also uh, amongst general practitioners. And it's something that's not widely accepted, yet there are over 100 controlled clinical trials to support 
Um, there are three different techniques for actually reversing type 2 diabetes, but over 100 controlled clinical trials supporting a low carbohydrate diet in reversing uh, what has been called chronic, slowly progressive disease. And this is just one example I can give you. 56% uh, of patients with type 2 were able to reverse their disease in a 10-week period by utilizing a, a low-carb diet. And this is sustainable. There are patients now out to two years, and there is also patients who've had diabetes for over 10 years who've been able to reverse their metabolic dysfunction. And the Australian Dietary Guidelines is uh, long ready for an overhaul. It's outdated, it's flawed, and it's deeply biased. And yet it's very powerful. It informs what's eaten in schools, childcare, aged care, our hospitals, defence force and prisons. It also informs the uh, army of health providers and health educators, government policymakers in the food industry. There have been literally thousands of low-fat products made on the back of these dietary guidelines. Even Diabetes Australia says that people with diabetes should follow the Australian dietary guidelines. So Diabetes Australia is recommending people with diabetes follow the high carb diet recommended by the dietary guidelines. It makes no sense whatsoever. The guide itself says that the, it's intended for the average healthy person, but with over two thirds of Australian adults over the age of 24 being overweight or obese and about a third of kids, then the average Australian is not healthy. We actually don't need guidelines for healthy Aussies. We need guidelines for unhealthy Aussies, people with insulin resistance, type two diabetes or pre-diabetes. This is another really critical message. Natural saturated fats in our diet that have been demonized for the last 40 years. Um, products such as what you can see here on the screen, also whole fat dairy, unprocessed meat, and eggs. There's no evidence to show that they are associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Absolutely critical information that we all need to know as doctors. We should be encouraged to eat real food, not that packaged, uh, highly processed crap that we're consuming uh, by the gallon. We also need to see hard hitting ads on free to air TV. I created this TV commercial, which I'm going to show you now, uh, back in late 2018. I should have kept my medication up and I should have followed the plans that were given to me by my doctors. I woke up one morning completely blind. Um, thought I was dreaming, went back to sleep for an hour, uh, woke up and I was still completely blocked off. My wife's face when we went to bed. That was the last clear image I had. So that TV commercial played nationally on Channel 7 for about six weeks in late 2018. It's, it's quite hard hitting, isn't it? Just 30 seconds, very powerful. But such ads need to be played uh, across all channels uh, during prime time and for extended periods. My ad only played as a community service announcement, so probably only seen uh, in the wee hours of the morning. So to me, it's all about education. These days, would you leave a pack of cigarettes on the kitchen counter for your kids to enjoy? Absolutely not. So why would we leave a bowl of sugary treats? We need to exchange that bowl of sugary treats for the bowl of nuts, for example. We need to educate our kids, and yet we can't educate our kids and we, until we know and understand ourselves. How about those soft drinks in our fridge? Perhaps this is their gloomy future. Perhaps, like cigarettes, we need to make soft drinks socially unacceptable. I'm just gonna leave you with one last message from Neil Hansel from his hospital bed the day after his ninth amputation for gangrene due to his type two diabetes. I did had a little joke the other day and I put my hand up and I had a grain of sugar in my, between my fingers and I said, I meet my killer. And people are trying to see what was in my fingers and all it was was one grain of salt, uh, one grain of sugar. Um, and that's what it takes. You know, we've got to, we've got to, we, as a society, we have to do something. You've got to make people aware that the more sugar we intake, the worse this is going to get. Um, and it's just, it's not good. <laughs> it's not good. It's not good, is it? Not good at all. As an eye specialist, I never want to see another patient going needlessly blind due to their diabetes. As doctors, we shouldn't be seeing the life-changing, life-threatening consequences of a disease which is dietary and largely preventable. And as Australians, I truly believe it's time to put an end 
to type 2 diabetes. So thank you very much. I'm just going to play you or show you one last uh, image. This is uh, for those of you who are interested in following Site for All or my own um, journey this year as Australian of the Year. There's a number of social media handles there. You can also sign up to our newsletter on our website. Uh, I'm happy to paste that in the chat line if you like. Uh, so I'll stop sharing my screen now and if we have time, happy to take a, a couple of questions. So thanks once again to all of you for uh, being with uh, me today. Great, thank you so much, James. That was just a, there's a lot of uh, thought there is, uh, I, I guess, uh, a lot of things for us to contemplate and a lot of positive things that we can do. Um, we're running a little behind time. John, are there any, are there any uh, questions, burning questions that people have put, put in or, or submitted? Well, I might start with one, James. Look, thank you very much. It's very thought provoking and stimulating. How do you think we're going to find the people who don't turn up or how do we engage with the people who need to be screened for diabetes, who don't see a healthcare professional? How are we going to engage with those too? Yeah, well, of course, uh, it's a problem in all our practices, isn't it? Uh, just trying to constantly chase up these patients that don't turn up for their review, don't turn up for their injections. It's terribly frustrating, often the younger ones. And, and so uh, <coughs> Neil, Han Neil Hansel, the, the guy that I showed you who went suddenly blind, he'd uh, basically neglected his, his eyes. Uh, he was um, a busy man. He was, he was uh, thin um, and on the go, uh, but was drinking about four litres of Coke every single day from for about 10 years from the time he uh, uh, started earning money at 16 to when he was diagnosed with type 2 at the age of 26. So, uh, you know, he was really uh, putting himself at severe risk. Um, but there was also another person who's blind in both eyes that I, I know quite well as a patient. And uh, she was a corporate uh, lady, uh, high flying, uh, busy, just didn't have time to have her eyes checked. So really, I think it's about awareness, isn't it? I think we just need to all reinforce to our patients what can happen. And quite often I will play that, um, you know, if I have a patient that's not been turning up and you know, we all have those chronic sort of non-attenders, when we finally get them back, I'll show them that ad and I'll say, you know, this is what can happen. And, and just raising the awareness, it needs to start way back uh, at the general practice level as well. Uh, so um, I think this is something that uh, we need to, to general practitioners need to be talking about and we need to have as I said during my presentation an awareness strategy raising awareness broadly uh, on social media and all media channels free to air tv it's something that I've never ever seen on free to air tv and so that ad that I played towards the end there you know that's the sort of thing if it's played uh, across all of the channels hopefully the message will eventually get out there and, and to people and I met with Greg Hunt last week and I uh, presented to him something along the lines of this presentation, but, but with some more hard hitting facts and uh, financial figures, uh, the impact on, um, on the government. And uh, he's uh, vowed to address both the preventability and reversibility of type two diabetes now. So uh, hopefully we'll start to see uh, some action, uh, of the government taking some action. I think it's long overdue. Thanks James. <clears throat> John, maybe uh, in the interests of uh, time, we maybe should uh, should move on, and uh, we can have any other questions in, in in the chat line. Okay. Well, look, James, you're, we're, we've got a couple of uh, cases. The first one is uh, is presented by Jess Song, who's going to uh, hopefully share her screen now and uh, talk about a patient who started seeing double. Yeah. All right, can everyone see my screen? Yep. yep. Perfect. So, hi everyone, I'm Jess, I'm one of the Sydney Eye Registrars. I'll be presenting a case um, about seeing double at today's Grand Rounds. So our case history was an 83-year-old male. He came in complaining about a four-year history of binocular diagonal diplopia and imbalance. He's tripped once in the last year, hasn't had any falls, um, but he's also complaining about glare for a similar duration. He's had multiple returns to the ophthalmologist and no remedy or solution, and there was no injury or illness at onset of these symptoms. 
In terms of his ocular history, he's had both cataracts done, the right eye done five years ago, the left eye done four years ago. He's had bilateral and tropian repairs 15 years ago. He didn't have any patching during childhood or any other visual problems. His medical history was just bowel surgery four years ago, hypertension, and he's taking Panadol and Nexium. In terms of his examination, his vision was 6, 7.5 in both right and left eyes, and his pressure was 8 in the right and 10 in the left. On observation, he had a right head tilt in primary gaze and no diplopia in primary gaze. These set of images weren't um, of our patients, but it was closely representative. So mostly demonstrating an elevation palsy, um, sorry, an elevation restriction in the left eye and the patient uh, describing seeing double in far left gaze and up and sometimes in down left gaze. Um, so this is a video of again, a representative um, patient, just demonstrating that subtlety on covetous. I hope it's playing for everyone. So just demonstrating that really subtle um, left hypotropia on cover test, which our patient had and that worsened on left gaze and left up gaze. The three-step test demonstrated no change um, on left or right head tilt. There was no ptosis, good LPS function, and the anterior and posterior exam was normal. We do have a HES chart um, of our patient here, demonstrating on the left, there is um, elevation limitation, more so on uh, left gaze, and that slight hypo on the left. So our impression at this point in time was a restricted left eye elevation. Um, and in terms of the differential diagnoses, I might invite uh, Dr. Donaldson to make some comments at this time. Uh, thank you, Jess. That's, um... That's great. Um, as far as uh, double vision is concerned, diplopia is concerned. Um, if it's vertical diplopia, particularly in an adult, then really you've got to go down the line of either a fourth nerve palsy, thyroid, or trauma. Um, this person, I don't know where you're going to go with this talk, Jess, but this person had no history of trauma, obvious trauma to the head. Um, thyroid function, everything was normal and there was no past history and no clinical signs of a fourth nerve palsy. So that then led us down the path of, okay, so what's going on with this person? And I, I've seen a number of these cases now, so um, I, I sort of knew what was going on. But um, do you want to continue now, Jess, with uh, where you're going with this talk? Yep. So... Um... As mentioned, our differential diagnoses were thyroid, a fourth nerve palsy, or trauma, um, or potentially a cataract surgery that was uh, block related. So in terms of the progress, we did an MRI brain that demonstrated no intraconal or extraconal masses. There was no evidence of any intracranial lesions. There were just some gliotic changes. The impression here was likely a left inferior rectus tightening related to a cataract surgery blocked and the patient was subsequently booked for a left inferior rectus recession with adjustable sutures. So post-operatively, the patient was very happy. Uh, on cover test distance and near, the patient was orthotropic um, and having no diplopian primary gaze, just some double vision in up um, and up left gaze. So I thought I'd take this opportunity to talk about causes of diplopia post cataract surgery. So there are a number of causes that can uh, cause diplopia post-surgery, um, some being unmasking of a pre-existing disorder that may have been there preoperatively. It could be due to surgical or anesthetic trauma. So this would be direct needling to the muscle or the nerves, um, ischemia from swelling or hematoma. There could be pseudophagic changes, so things like optical aberrations from an isometropia, IOL decentration, brightness or color disparity, glare or halos. There could be prolonged visual deprivation from the cataract leading to bismuth, such as in a case of long-standing unilateral traumatic cataract. 
there could be residual effects of the anesthetic or anesthetic induced hematoma, a decompensator heterophoria, such as an ESO and exophoria, or childhood strabismus or amblyopia that may predispose to the emergence of diplopia post op. In terms of anesthetic induced strabismus, it's reported, um, it has been reported with retrobulba at a 0.23 to 0.4% incidence and peribulba in 0.64 to 1% incidence. There have also been a few case reports that have demonstrated that uh, it can occur post subtenons and blunt cannulas. Any muscle, uh, any rectile muscle can be affected, and the mechanisms are thought to be due to trauma from needle or cannula to the muscles or nerves, toxicity from the anesthetic agent itself. Hematoma, um, injury to the muscles, bridal suture trauma, or the gentamicin inflammatory reaction or myotoxicity. In terms of how these patients tend to uh, present, they're often very subtle, small angles, uh, usually vertical, typically showing a hypotropia on the first day that persists um, into a hypotropia um, permanently. Their diplopia can be resolved with prisms, and they often have no previous ophthalmic history or any previous diplopia, and have noticed a diplopia immediately after the surgery that doesn't go away. So in conclusion, um, some things to keep in mind. Uh, local anesthetic, they can cause strabismus through myotoxicity. It's more likely with retrobulbar or peribulbar delivery, although sometimes subtenons can cause it. Hyaluronidae seems to have some sort of a protective effect. That's due to um, what we believe to be the increase of spreading of the anesthetic with less accumulation in the muscle. Um, and there have been reports of reduced rebismus with its use and rarer cases of toxicity. The inferior rectus is the most commonly um, affected and involved with hypertropia. It can evolve several weeks to months postoperatively and treatment has been shown to be very successful with either prisms in their spectacles or strabismus surgery. And a th few things to consider preoperatively include assessing patients' ocular motility pre-op, looking for any pre-existing strabismus or amblyopia that have remained unnoticed due to either a dense cataract, asking whether there were any patching um, or str strabismus surgery as a child, and always discussing on the cataract consent uh, with a possibility of postoperative diplopia and requiring potentially requiring a second operation to correct the strabismus. Thank you. Terrific. Th thanks. Thanks very much, Jess. That was a, that was a really an interesting case. I think, in the interests of time, Craig, have you got any uh, comments, additional comments you want to make, or are you happy with? Uh, uh, no, look, I think that's pretty good in the interest of time. I've probably seen over 20 of these now over the years. They tend to do pretty well. Sometimes we've got to uh, sacrifice diplopia and upgaze, which is which is usually not a problem for most of these people who are older. Um, but the, the thing is just doing a good preoperative assessment so you know that there wasn't some underlying condition that you missed. But uh, certainly it's around and it's usually due to my toxicity. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks very much, Craig. Thanks, thanks again, Jess. Thank you. In the interest of, uh, of time, we might move on to the uh, to the second presentation, which Ryan is going to uh, present. Ryan, can you, Jess, if you unshare your screen and we'll yep, I've just unshared it. Great, fantastic. All right, well, over to you, Ryan. Yep. Can you see my slides? Yes. Yep. Oh, hello. Hi, my name is Ran. I'm one of the first year trainees. So uh, I'm going to talk about a case that I saw with Dr. Huynh a few weeks ago. So this is a 16 year old male. He presented with sudden onset blur vision in the right eye um, after he wrestled with his friend. So he has amblyopia in the left eye due to anisometropia. Uh, he has no significant past medical history and he's not taking any regular medication. Uh, there's no family history of any eye disease as well. So on examination, his vision in the right eye is 6 on 48, left is 6 on 19. Um, his pupillary reflex is normal. There's no RAPD. Um, the anterior segment examination is normal as well. So uh, now I'm just going to show you the octopus photo of his right eye. Um, so you can see on the left-hand side, um, there's a quite... Uh, 
there's a quite large um, vascular lesion with associated exudates. And there are also a pair of um, quite dilated vessels as well. It's a little bit hard to appreciate on this Oppo's photo, but he actually has retinal detachment um, around this area as well. Uh, on the right hand side, it's just an enlarged view of this lesion. I'm just going to show you, oh, sorry, just the previous one. So he got two more lesions as well. So on the nasal side, um, this is the left eye presentation. You can see superiorly as well as temporally, there are two small uh, vascular tumors. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm going to skip the interaction part, um, but this is quite a typical presentation for one hippolindau disease. So uh, I'm just going to show you the OCT now. So on the right hand side, this is the OCT of the right eye. You can see that there's quite significant subrenal fluid at the macula. And this fluid actually tracks down from the superior temporal lesion that we saw initially. Um, the left eye is essentially normal. And in terms of the investigations, um, patients with VHL may develop multiple benign and malignant tumors involving various organs. So different guidelines have been published for the screening of VHL disease. But the common screening tests including, uh, include urinary catecholamines, brain MRI, and abdominal imaging for early detection of the manifestations. So for this patient, it was found that he has multiple cerebellar and spinal hemangioblastomas. He also got two um, kidney lesions, which are suggestive of angiomyolipomas, and two cysts in the pancreas head. These um, catecholamines are quite normal. He also underwent genetic testing, and in the genetic testing, it was found that he got this VHL mutation and his parents and sibling also underwent genetic testing and no mutation was detected. So in terms of the treatment, he had laser to the small lesions in the right and left eye, and he had cryotherapy to the right large temporal hemangioblastoma, uh, as well as intravitreal anti-VG injection. Um, he was also given prednisolone 50 mg daily for one week. So I understand the purpose of the intravitreal anti-VGF injection is that if we just go, uh, give cryotherapy alone, it might actually uh, exacerbate the exudation and anti-VGF will reduce the risk of it. Um, Dr. Huinia, would you want to comment on the treatment? Uh, thanks, Rand. In the interest of time, I won't. Um... Oh, okay, sure. I will go ahead with the um, progress. So this is the progress at OCT at six days um, of anti-VEGF and cryotherapy. So you can see that at six days, the subrenal fluid has almost resolved. Um, there are still some residual exudates. At two months post cryotherapy and anti-VEGF treatment, um, the, sub, the uh, exudate has reduced, but the vision actually stays roughly the same um, as its presentation. I'm just going to go through a few slides on VHL. So VHL is quite rare. Its incidence is about one in 40,000. It has a high penetrance of 90% by 65 years of age. It is caused by a mutation near tumor suppressor gene called the VHL gene. So this gene is present on chromosome three and it participates in cellular oxygen sensing. Um, the VHL protein upregulation eventually leads to production of endogenesis factors such as VGF and PDGF. Um, both of these are thought to play an important role in the development of neoplastic vascular lesions in VHL. Um, in this review paper, the frequency of retinal hemangioblastomas have been reported to be around uh, 50 to 60%. Uh, this is the second most frequent manifestations after the CNS uh, hemangioblastoma. However, the retinal hemangioblastoma are often the first manifestation. So although retinal lesions are hematomas in nature, they are usually not present at birth. The average uh, age of onset is actually 25 years of age, uh, which is actually the lowest among all the other clinical features. Um, so the other man uh, manifestations are quite common as well, 
but they typically present after 30 years of age. <coughs> And uh, in terms of treatments, um, these are the possible uh, the uh, treatments that have been trialed in VHL. So laser is the is most effective in lesions that are quite small, so which is less than 1.5 millimeter. But it also has also, has also been used in uh, lesions up to 4.5 millimeter with some shown regression. Um, the laser can be applied directly to the hemangioblastoma or the vessels or combination of both. Um, larger lesions are typically not destroyed even after several uh, sessions of late laser. So in this case, usually cryotherapy can be used for the destruction of these masses um, in, in the presence of concurrent oxidation, hemorrhage or fibrosis. One study actually suggested that cryotherapy should be the mainstay of treatment for hemangioblastomas blastomas bigger than 1.5 millimeter in diameter. Uh, external beam radiotherapy, proton beam radiotherapy, as well as plaque radiotherapy are additional treatment modalities for large lesions, uh, which, which demonstrate poor response to cryotherapy and or laser. So one study showed that severe visual reduction, persisting retinal detachment or tractional detachment can happen after these treatments though. So therefore it is recommended to restrict the use of these treatments to lesions without an exudative detachment. Um, PDT has been used as well. It has variable outcomes, but usually it's not effective enough to be used routinely. Um, in terms of anti-VGF, um, it has been investigated in a few studies and the results have been quite variable. It is thought that theoretically uh, it might accelerate the clearance of hemorrhages and exudation, which will lead to improvement of visual acuity. And some case studies actually showed some efficacy. But in one other study, uh, which used Avastin in five patients uh, who received an average of roughly 10 injections over one year, they actually found that visual acuity actually dropped by two lines and there was no consistent reduction in tumor size or improvement in exudation. Um, surgical excision has been used as well. However, um, patients can develop PVR, which limits the visual outcome. And um, now this is just my last slide on summary. So I think we- Ryan, can I make a quick comment? Can yeah, I make sure. a quick comment? Sorry yeah. to interrupt there. But uh, just on, on the treatment, uh, I've yeah. been using photodynamic therapy with yeah. Visudyne uh, quite a yeah. bit in recent years and mm. finding really good results. Uh, of course, in children with VHL, you may not be able to use it yeah. uh, because they may not be able to sit up at the sit down to have the laser mm. delivered. But mm. it's certainly in, in older, older kids, such as a 16 year old uh, and older people who don't have VHL, but who have retinal capillary hemangioblastomas, it, it works mm. superbly. Um, I'd be happy to share yeah. uh, a presentation with you, but uh, we probably don't have time today. But it's, uh, um, the very first time I used it um, was just a solitary lesion with significant yeah. associated exudation and, and bingo within uh, first review, uh, the, the lesion had dramatically shrunk and the exudation and the subretinal fluid had cleared. And I gave it one or two more hits for good measure over the next couple of months. And the thing what you, you want to watch out for is normalization of the feeding vessel and draining vein. That's really important. Yeah. I think with the anti-VEGF, if there is a threat of, to the macula of any exudation prior to giving treatment, mm. as you say, it's probably not a bad idea to, to give it a go. But I think they're so leaky, these lesions, that mm. uh, the anti-VEGF actually doesn't work very well. But certainly with PDT, uh, I think it's uh, great. And for example, that case you, could, you had there, you could, with the one infusion, treat every single one of those lesions. And uh, mm. it doesn't take that long and it's not uncomfortable. Uh, and I think it's quite a, a doable thing for, for an older kid, particularly. Yeah, yeah James, it's Alex. I just want to point out that the anti-VEGF injection was not to have any impact on the hemangioblastoma. Um, it was just to reduce the, the uptick that you get in the exudation. Um, and, and similarly with the short course of, uh, of steroids, because the getting a, a really, he already had quite a large exudative detachment there and I didn't want him to you know, have a, have a large detachment. So that was a reason for that. That was just really a, a one-off. Um, Anti-VEGF really doesn't work. Um, for these lesions, they've got very high flow and mature vasculature. So I don't think it's a 
a treatment for the for the lesion itself, just for the um, just for the exudation in the short term. Um, the PDT look at that. It's interesting that you've had such a positive um, experience with it. I'll certainly um, discuss it with his parents. Um, the other small lesions, I've just lasered and they've gone away. Um, so um, they're because they're small and, and not difficult to treat. But um, yeah, I'll certainly um, certainly consider it. PDTs. Not um, not as cheap as it used to be now, unfortunately. Oh, it's gone off the uh, compassionate uh, yep. list, hasn't it? Unfortunately, uh, yeah, exactly. Some of us still have supplies of PDT in our fridge, so <laughs> still yeah, able to they, use it. But um, it's, they it's, they expire in one week. Is that right? <laughs> yep. End of October. Very handy. Oh, in one. Oh, okay. What, no, yeah. Right. Got it. Better start using it. Thanks, right. Alex. Yeah. Yeah. Th thanks, James. Thanks, Alex, and thanks, Ran, for an excellent, uh, excellent presentation and a really interesting case. James, I would just like to say thanks again. That was a, a really inspiring uh, talk with uh, an enormous number of really important messages for us as as ophthalmologists, as doctors, and as members of uh, of our community. I think we've got a a, a very important task to perform in front of us and we've got to get out there and start as you say spreading the message so look on behalf of the 60 plus people that turned up to listen to you thank you so much for your time and your expertise congratulations again on being such a well-deserved australian of the year and uh, you know you're doing a great job thank you very much and hopefully we'll all be able to see each other in person next year Absolutely, Peter. Thank you so much. And, and it's interesting as an ophthalmologist, for 30 years I mentioned just dealing with, with this disease, but never once thinking to talk to the patient about their diet. Uh, and, and yet, um, in recent weeks, I've been chatting to some of my patients saying, have you talked about a, a low carb uh, dietary solution to reverse your type 2 diabetes? And virtually none of them were even aware of it. So I think as ophthalmologists, we can now at least put that thing in the mind, that, that idea in the mind of our patients uh, that they can talk to their GPs and discuss it because the more we can get that message out there, this is really critical information, the ability to reverse a, a disease which was thought chronic and uh, just a downhill slide. So thank you very much. And thanks again to, to the eye and to all the colleagues out there. Um, thank, thank you very much, James. Well, look, good night, everyone. Um, it's been a really terrific uh, cold colloquium yet again. Thanks very much. As they say, keep safe and we'll see you all soon. Good night. Good night. Thank you.